Welcome to the second episode of Mr. Retro Wolf. This time we're going to do a review of the Tank Battalion game schematics and take a look at three of the logic chips that make up the timing circuit in both breadboard and Verilog configs. Let's get going. Okay, let's start by looking at the game instructions and schematics that came with the Tank Battalion arcade game. You can get these from the GitHub in the video description or from a bunch of sites that are dedicated to arcade schematics. The document has a description of the game telling you the parts on the screen like player and enemy tanks, walls and scoring elements. Down at the bottom it tells you where to see how many lives you have and on the right how many enemy tanks are remaining. There's a quick review about how to play the game, then information about the service menus and dip switch settings. We've got some overall hardware info and then this page talks about all the pin connects in the cab. This is interesting to us to know the control and screen output pins. Now to the schematics. It really is a very simple design that has the following blocks. The MOS 6502 CPU for processing. Four 2716 EEPROM chips of 2K capacity each to store the game program. Six 2114 RAM chips of 4-bit words, meaning that you need two of them to make a full byte to store game info and also screen information. The address decoding circuit to allow the CPU to select RAM, ROM or input output. The color output circuit, including a flip-flop, and a color prom chip to output to the screen. The tile rendering circuit, including a pixel renderer and tile ROM chip, using another 2716 EEPROM. The sprite rendering circuit, used for bullets only in this game and including a slip counter method for movement. A set of selector chips to allow the memory to flip between use by the CPU or by the video circuit very interesting that we'll be looking at in future projects. On the second page we have a horizontal timing circuit made up of a crystal oscillator, flip-flops and 4-bit counter chips. The vertical timing circuit that uses the same techniques and outputs the composite sync to allow the CRT display to show images. We'll be covering this circuit in this episode and the next episode. the dip switch and controller input circuit. The output circuit to reset the watchdog timer and also trigger sounds. And finally, the sound circuitry. A very nice compact design. So 
So onto the logic chips that make up the timing circuit in Tank Battalion. We have the 18 MHz Pizzo Crystal Oscillator, 74LS368 Tri-State Inverter Buffer, 74LS107 JK Flip-Flop, 74LS74 Positive Edge Trigger D Flip-Flop, and the 74LS161 Synchronous 4-Bit Counter. The clock circuit is comprised of a pizza crystal oscillator, in our case frequency of 18.432 MHz. This divides down to 6 MHz for the display timing and 1 MHz for the CPU timing. The clock circuit has this specific resistor capacitor combination and inverter gates to ensure a square wave is output at the 7B chip leg 5. You'll always be able to find this kind of detail in your arcade boards since the clock is also identical to this setup. Here they are using the 74LS368 Tri-State Inverter Buffer. Not sure exactly why they're doing that since you can just use a normal 74LS04 inverter. In fact if you look at another board schematic you can see here exactly them doing just that using normal inverters instead of the 368. Here's my breadboard setup with the chips pre-populated. Just using a regular barrel jack power supply. For this build I found out that I needed a beefy amperage and so this is 5 volts and 2 amps. External is ground and internal is 5 volts. I also use this one on my Amstrad 6128. So here's the board with the power plugged in. I like to have a multimeter hooked up to tell me what the voltage is. You can get strange things happening so it's good to see if your power will suddenly drop. I have quite a few large old ROM chips here. Here's the timing circuit on the breadboard. We have the 18 MHz crystal oscillator with resistors and capacitors. I've used the LS368 Tri-State Inverter Buffers, although we saw earlier you can use the plain old inverters. thing to note here is to connect the pin 1 and 15 to ground on these. We have the 107 JK flip-flops in master-slave configuration, the D flip-flop LS74, and then the two 4-bit counters to give us the horizontal counting lines, and finally an inverter chip. I've added decoupling capacitors to the power lines to try to smooth out the supply to these chips as it is good practice. I'm going to hook up a logic analyzer to show the output of the oscillator circuit. I'm using here the Kingst LA1010. It has 16 channels and can go up to 100 MHz with 3 channels, 32 MHz with 9 and 16 MHz with 16 channels. I'm going to show me hooking up the probes unedited in this first video to show you how fiddly it is to get them connected. We'll see another way of connecting the probes in some videos coming up. The logic analyzer has two sets of eight channels and a ground for each set of eight. I'll attach the ground to the ground pin of the chip here. Then the channel zero to the pin seven, which is the second inverter in the schematic. Channel 1 will be connected to the 1Q output of the Master 107 JK flip-flop. And channel 2 will connect to pin 2Q of the same chip.
You can see here how they pop off very easily, usually all one after the other. It's all part of the fun. Okay, so in our logic analyzer software, with the probes attached and the analyzer attached via the USB, we can select the number of channels to look at here. If I press the green button, we collect data, and I realize I haven't turned on the power to the breadboard. So it makes sense, I get the signals. Okay, power on, and now lots of info. I can zoom in by pressing the left mouse button and out by pressing the right one. You can see that the signal from the second inverter should be 18.43 megahertz. It does average out to be that, but we're getting a bit of variability. Not sure if this is because we're using a breadboard or if this is typical for this kind of component. You can see the output for channel one and two are pretty regular, but still have some slight variability on the period. I was interested to see if an all-in-one pizza oscillator can, like the one shown, would give a more consistent output, but after measuring the output as shown, I got exactly the same kinds of frequencies as with the single crystal oscillator. Sometimes you'll see these kind of components on PCBs instead of the crystal resistor capacitor inverter combination, just due to less components. Okay, I'm going to show you this really great software for mocking up a virtual breadboard. I use this to get an understanding for a particular chip without hooking up LEDs, etc. It's pretty quick and you can save it very easily. It's in Spanish, but we can work it out. You can add a breadboard and then some switches, some LEDs, and then a clock circuit. Now we'll add a simple inverter chip. Then we need to connect up all the parts to power, red for live, black for ground. To remove a wire, you can right click it. We'll connect the switches and connect the output of the NOT gate. Power it on and you can see it working. Okay, if we add a clock to it, you can also see that working. So you get the idea. Here is a test circuit for the 74LS74. 
which is a dual D flip-flop. If you want to know more about D flip-flops, JK flip-flops, etc., try to read up about them in the resources mentioned in the last episode. It won't be the focus of this series to cover how these components work, more getting them into Verilog and into an arcade design. I've connected the chip up to a clock, some switches and some LEDs, and we can go through the logic table to see what happens. So first is high clear and low preset, which gives Q output high. Reversing the preset and the clear give the opposite. Both low give an unstable condition. Both high gives us whatever the D input is on the next positive edge of the clock cycle. Okay, so that's the 74LS74. Okay, so we've got EDA Playground going, and we're gonna go to, I'm gonna show you code that I've created for the three logic chips. I'm gonna start off with the uh, 74. So you can see here, I've got my code. I've got the pinner here. I like to do this just that shows a pinout. And then uh, we're declaring the module, module 74. Uh, we've effectively got two of the same. So uh, preset one, preset two, clear one, clear two, clock one, clock two, D1, D2, Q1, Q2, and not Q1, not Q2. So effectively, it's going to all be doing the same, so no problem. Um, this code will just be doubled. So what happens is, in an always block, it's going to be if you get in a positive edge of the clock, or a negative edge of the preset, or a negative edge of the clear, begin to do something. So let's say we have one of those conditions. So then it says, so. It's saying if the negative, uh, if the not preset one, if it's zero, we opposite that and make it one. We always are looking for something to be true. So if it's zero, then it'll make it one. Then Q1 equals one. So that's as we saw, that's the condition when you preset, preset zero, Q is one. Else, if, and then uh, at the end, outside of this, not Q1 is obviously the opposite of Q1, so that would be zero. Else, if we don't have a uh, preset equals zero, then it says, is clear zero? If clear is zero, negated to one, um, then Q1 equals zero. And again, that's the opposite, so that would be one, Q1 would equal, and Q1 would equal one. Else, just let, uh, Q1 equal whatever D is, and that's what we saw in the, uh, the previous code. So that is the code, and then we're just doing that again for the second part of the of the chip. Over here is the here is the module uh, that we're creating. It's a simulation module, so we're opening module test. We don't have any input outputs because it's not an actual FPGA. So we open the module, then we close the module, and inside we've got some stuff happening. So we've got some setting up of registers, instantiating something. Here this always block is creating a clock. So always every 10 cycles, we're gonna say clock equals not clock. That should be that way around. Uh, then inside this initial begin module this is just telling it what it's going to do so this is specific to the compiler we're going to dump a bit of information into this dump.vcd file that's not a big issue it's pretty standard 
And then here we can say what to do with our variables that we created here um, at certain points. So after 30 clock cycles, make clear zero, make not uh, preset one. And then we can, so we're gonna step through our logic table um, with these conditions. And then at 40 clock cycles, uh, these are all cumulative by the way, so 34 plus 40 plus 40 plus 40 plus 40, we'll finish. And let's see what that looks like. So over here, we want to run that. So we are using uh, system Verilog, Verilog. Uh, we are using UVM none, and then that is set to none. Tools and simulators, we are using the Aldec Riviera Pro 2020. Um, once you select that, these will come up as defaults. Very important, we want to have open EP wave after run. So that's going to show the waves, and that's the important thing. You can also download files after run. That's going to, you can't have both. So we can do that um, if you want. So here's our code. What we'll do is we've saved it, it needs to save, and then we'll run it. Goes through and it tells you if everything's all right, and bumps, we pop up with a waveform. So what we should do is that we should probably get it to be looking in terms of uh, inputs and outputs. So we've got our clock, we've got clear, not clear, D and D, and then here we can see that it's working exactly like it should. The important thing here is to see the Q and the not Q changing when the D is changed, but only on the next positive edge of the clock cycle. Here I've got the 74LS107 hooked up to the clock, switches and output LEDs. Let's turn it on. With clear low we have Q low and not Q high. Doesn't matter what the JK inputs are. With clear high and both JK inputs low, we have whatever the last Q states were with no change. With clear high, and J input high and K low, we have the Q being high and not Q is low. With clear high, J input low and K high, we have Q is low and not Q is high. With clear high and both J, K inputs high, we have the output toggling between Q and not Q. If you look at the toggle, you can see we only get it changing on the negative edge of the clock or when the clock goes out, which is as we need it. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the 107 uh, JK flip-flop. Go to my playgrounds, go to 107. Okay, so here, as before, we've got the module over on this side. We've got some test work over here. So 107 has a clear, a clock, a JK, a Q, and a not Q. So the code is a sign not Q is always the opposite of Q. Uh, we're gonna do an always block that says whenever there's a negative edge of the clock, do something. So if we get a negative edge of the clock, we're gonna say is clear one. So if clear was zero, and we negate that by doing this, it equals one, then Q equals zero. Obviously that will then be not Q equals one. Else, we're gonna use a case statement, JK, and here we're concatenating J here and K here, so that would be what J is, that would be what K is. So whatever that inputs are up here, it then is concatenated there, so if it's zero, zero, then Q is what Q was. If uh, K is one, then Q is zero. If J is one, then Q is one. And if both J and K are one, then Q is not Q. So we're toggling as we saw. Okay, so that's the code. And then over here again, we've got our test module 
we're setting up the variables clock j k not clear and then wires q and q register is where obviously we can set um, values wire is just typically a resultant I'm going to set up our 107 call it ic1 and we're going to just put in our variables as we set, set them out there and then down here as before we can change those variables uh, as time goes on and recreate our truth table so as before we've got the uh, this one here I think this time we're using this one I don't, it doesn't matter uh, really it's pretty much the same as far as we're concerned in the synopsis VC 2020 this time uh, open EP wave after run that's the same so we want to run that The important thing to note here is the toggling happens when clear is high and both JK are high and that change occurs on the negative edge of the clock. Okay, so finally time to look at the 74LS161, the 4-bit counter. We have it connected to a clock, some switches, and some LEDs. Clear, load, NP, NT, and data in are connected to switches, and data out are connected to LEDs. So let's turn it on. First up, clear is low, and all the outputs are low no matter what. Clear is high and load is low, the outputs are whatever the inputs are, all zeros here. If we put that first bit to 1, then you can see the output bit moves high too. No change when clear and load are high, but either NP or NT are low. If clear, load, NP and NT are all high, then it starts to count from the loaded number. Note that the carry LED with the blue wire working as we max out the bit counter. As you can see, if we change the initial number to be 1010, then load it and make load high, the counter counts from the loaded number 1010. Okay, now we want to do the 161 counter. So we're going to my playgrounds 161. Okay, here I've got the uh, chip again, inputs and outputs. So module 161. Here we've got a clear, we've got a clock, we've got D in. That's four bits of a D in, so it's three to zero. We've got an enable P, enable T. And not load and we've got an output Q again the output is 4 bits 3 to 0 and we've got an output carry uh, we're setting up an intermediate register called data which is also going to mimic the Q 
which is 4 bits wide, we're setting that to 4 bits of 0. Um, now we've got an always block, so in every positive edge of the clock or a negative edge of the clear, do something. So if uh, not clear is 0, uh, negated, so if not clear is essentially if clear is 1, then set all of the data to be 0. And out here we've got Q equals data, so we're setting that Q to be all zeros. Else, if we haven't got a clear situation, if if load is set to zero, then we're obviously loading. So data is whatever the um, the input is, as we saw that's the case. So Q then becomes whatever D in is on that load. Else, if neither of those two are low, then if only if enable p and enable t are both one so that's what that does it's a logical uh, test is if that and that are one then it equals one so it's true then data equals data plus one and um, they're doing that in decimals so that's going to count so if neither of those if they're not both one then it's not going to do anything it's going to stay where we were so as we said before Q equals data, and here we're saying the carry, if data 0, 1, 2, and 3, and um, the enable T are all 1, then our, uh, our carry bit also is 1, as we saw in our breadboard example. So that's the code of the 161 in Verilog. Module under test, so same thing, we're setting up a module. I've created registered for all registers for all those variables. I'm also brought out, we've got the Q here, um, it will show it in terms of a hexadecimal number, but also for clarity, um, I've pulled out each individual bit there as well. Uh, we're then setting the, instantiating the 161, I've called it 161 again, putting in all the variables as put above, and then here again, in terms of the time, we're just changing these to be in line with the uh, truth table. So on this one, uh, I've used the synopsis again, enable uh, EP wave after run. So we run that. And there we go. Now these are so many signals here, it wants me to choose which one. So I press get signals, test. Uh, there's a lot there. So I'm just going to go down and say, uh, whoop, whoop, whoop. Append, you can either choose some, I'm going to say append all, close, okay, so here we've got the clock, let's put these a bit higher, so we'll move that one up, move that one up as well, and that one, and the load, and then we're going to move that one up as well. Okay, the important thing to notice on this one is that the counter resets instantly when clear is asserted and doesn't wait until the next clock cycle. For that to happen, we need to use that 163 chip, which is the synchronous reset. Okay, again, thanks for joining me. Next time, we'll put all the code we've learned together to create the timing circuit and compare the output we get on the physical breadboard to the Verilog version. So I'll see you next time.